forward. Welcome Biology 1100 students to chapter 14 of Biology 1100 at Vancouver Community College. So we have just determined that I have exceptional students <laughs> and my students have uh, various traits and we determined whether those traits were dominant or recessive. So Mendelian genetics is about dominant and recessive alleles for specific traits. Questions of heredity have been around for a long time. We question our heredity. Um, both my parents had blue eyes and I turn out to have blue eyes. So blue eye color, however, is not strictly Mendelian. It's not strictly dominant and recessive for one gene. Rather, there are more, there's more than one gene involved in eye color, but it's, it's always used because it's, it's such an obvious thing. But questions of heredity have gone on for a long time. The Babylonians, the ancient Egyptians, uh, they were already involved in agriculture. So choosing certain um, strains of wheat or barley and breeding them or choosing them in order that they would have um, an optimal strain for food purposes. Pedigrees have been studied for a long time. A pedigree is where you look back on your ancestors and see whether or not they carried a particular trait. We'll look at pedigrees and see if we can't determine from them what the probabilities are of our offspring inheriting certain traits from us. Uh, Cross-pollination has gone on for a long time in agriculture. So taking the pollen from one plant and placing it on the stigma of another plant. Although it might not have been known exactly how that worked, nevertheless, it was practiced for quite a long time. Uh, Pythagoras in 500 BC assumed that the male was the dominant parent. So the inheritance of humans trait the traits would all be from the male, the father, and the female was there to house and to nourish a growing embryo. Um, and Empedocles in 453 BC thought that blending was the way that inheritance happened. So, you know, if you had white paint and red paint and you mix them together, you get pink. So there was a blending of traits. And Aristotle he, uh, thought that semen was purified blood. And that theory lasted for 2000 years, interestingly. A Harvey and Leeuwenhoek discovered eggs and fertilization. Um, but one of the reasons that it was discovered was because of the advent of the microscope. What genetic principles account for transmission of traits from parents to offspring? Those are the questions of genetic inheritance. Even Darwin thought there was blending of traits and even co contradict his, his own theory of evolution by natural selection. Selection selects certain traits over others. But he felt that if you put two colors of ink together, you would get a blended color of ink, which you would, but that is not necessarily the case for traits. If you have, um, uh, let's see, if you had um, red hair and, well, no, that's not a very good example. You might indeed get an intermediate. Um, but we talked about um, putting the left thumb over the right thumb. That's a, a dominant trait. Putting the right thumb over the left thumb is a recessive trait. There really isn't much in between. You can't really blend those two. The particulate hypothesis of inheritance is the gene idea, although the term gene wasn't coined for quite a long time. But that means that parents pass on discrete heritable units that we now call genes. 
So what I'd like to do today, in a, in a moment, we're going to do some practice crosses. But let's see, let's learn a little bit about Mendel. Mendel was a monk. And he worked in a monastery, and I suppose had quite a bit of free time. <laughs> it turns out that uh, monasteries are great places for discoveries. Sometimes the discovery is like beer or something like that. But Gregor Mandel was involved in inheritance. He very carefully conducted plant breeding experiments. Gregor Mandel. And he chose to work with peas. Well, they're available in many varieties. And he could strictly control which plants mated with which. So he had a very specific method for his experiments. He would remove uh, the stamens from a plant. Here he removed the stamens from a purple flower. The stamens hold the anthers with pollen. Pollen contains the sperm. And then he would transfer the pollen to the female plant or the female part of the flower, which is the carpal. The carpal contains the stigma which is the specific part of the plant on which pollen lands. So he pollinated the carpal And then he let the carpal mature into a pod. So when a plant is fertilized, it forms seeds and the seeds are often covered in fruits. In peas, the fruit is the pod. This is the pod part here. And it encases the seeds, protects the seeds. And then he would examine the offspring. So he would plant the seeds and examine the offspring. What, what color were they? In this case, it was flowers. So the first generation is the parental generation. Denoted with a P, a capital P. That's the parent. The first generation is called the F1. F stands for familial. So those were his experiments. And the reason he could do that is because he would breed say purple flowers with purple flowers over and over until that's all he had. And that is known as creating a pure breeding strain. And he would do the same with plants that had white flowers. He would breed them over and over until all he got were white flowers. So he would consider those pure breeding strains. So in this case, he used a pea shape. So they have smooth peas and wrinkled peas. He crossed them. In the F1 generation, he found they were all smooth. So he noted in the first generation, the F1, the recessive trait disappeared. There were no wrinkled individuals in that generation. But to his surprise, in the F2 generation, they reappeared. So that was quite strong evidence against lending. So these were discrete traits. It's either a smooth trait or a wrinkled trait. There really isn't an in-between blended kind of trait. Um, so this is the F2 generation. This is the F1 here. This is the parent. And this is the F2, the second generation. So what he did was allow the smooth pea plants 
to self-fertilize. So they just uh, fertilized within the group. Um, yeah, so uh, there is some terminology involved with genetics. I'd like to go over some of that now. Uh, a character. A character uh, is a heritable feature, such as flower color. I sometimes use character and trait and phenotype. I use them interchangeably. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but technically, a trait is the actual trait, the, the variant of a character. It's either purple or it's white. A homozygous is a term for an organism that has an organism that has identical alleles for a trait. Heterozygous is an organism that has different alleles for a trait. The term phenotype refers to the physical trait, the expression of that, so either purple or white in the case of our flowers. And the genotype uh, is the contributing alleles to the trait. So in the F2 generation, when Mendel crossed purple flowers and white flowers, he found that there was a three to one ratio of purple to white. He took the parent generation, true breeding, crossed them, took the pollen from one and, and uh, fertilized the other. He found that the F1 generation were all purple, but white individuals um, reappeared in the second generation. And it's, it's important that the ratio is three to one, interestingly. It shows how the trait was inherited. So he reasoned that, following Mendel's reasoning back then, in the F1 plants, only the purple flower factor, whatever that was, he didn't know, was affecting flower color. And then it must be, it must be dominant because it overshadowed or it masked the white trait. So the white flower must be a recessive trait. I don't know if he called it actually dominant and recessive, but uh, that's what he would mean by that. Whatever he was, whatever terminology he was using back then. So here's an explanation for that three to one inheritance. There are alternative versions of genes. We call them alleles. Um, they're the same thing. They're, they're a sequence of nucleotides. It's just that for one gene, there are two types of genes, and we call those two types alleles. So each character inherits two alleles, one from each parent. If they differ, then the dominant allele determines the organism's appearance. The other, no noticeable effect. Remember, this is Mendelian inheritance, strictly dominant recessive. Um, but it requires uh, a couple of different um, laws. One is called the law of segregation. In order for this to be true, the two alleles have to separate when the gametes are formed and end up in different gametes. So if, for example, here we have um, a germ cell, which will be divided into gametes or either eggs or sperm. In this case, we have one gene and another one. But when they divide after meiosis two, one gamete will get one and the other gamete will get the other one. They will never appear together in one gamete. Not in the case of Mendelian genetics. So here's an example of chromosomes. So these are chromosomes.
and they are homologous pairs of chromosomes. You and I have how many pairs? How many pairs of chromosomes do we have? 24. Almost, yeah, 23. So humans, 23 pairs. 46 chromosomes. So we have 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes. It's very important that word homologous because it means that they're similar, they code for the same characters. So the chromosomes code for the same characters. In other words, same genes, but may have alternate versions. traits, alleles. So a position on a chromosome that carries a sequence for a gene is known as a locus. Plural is loci. In this case, the locus is for the flower color gene. It will be in the same location on both chromosomes. This is the allele for white flower colors. And this is the allele for purple flowers. homologous chromosomes. Does it count for the three to one ratio, that's the phenotypic ratio in his numerous crosses? Did we identify uh, the difference between phenotype and genotype? So if for example, we say purple, is the allele for purple color. Then we've determined that white is, is a recessive color for flowers and we were going, oh geez, hang on, sorry, come back. No. Right, alleles. The recessive allele is always noted by, um, by the smaller case letter for the dominant one. So purple and white are phenotypes. The possible genotypes we can get given these two different alleles are that genotype, that genotype, or this genotype. So these are genotypes. In this case, we're just looking at one gene. So we can use a Punnett square for that. Have you used Punnett squares before? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, we'll, we'll do a bit of practice with Punnett squares in a moment. So, 
I can't actually do this because I know it's okay. Um, a Punnett square. Basically, we have purple flowers and white flowers. They're, they have been bred to be true breeding. So we know that the purple flowers are homozygous dominant. And we know that the white flowers are homozygous recessive. And we're going to cross them. And this is our P1 generation or our parent generation. Well, the first thing we have to ask is what are the possible gametes that these parents can have? In other words, um, when they go through meiosis, what kinds of gametes will the germ cells produce? In this case, it's quite simple. If there are only dominant alleles in this plant, that's the only thing that the gamete will ever carry. And in this case, they're recessive. So you have to be quite careful with letters because it's, it's easy to get them mixed up if they look similar, the capital and the, and the lowercase. So we cross them, then this gamete will fertilize one of those gametes and our F1 population will have this genotype because that's the only possible genotype there is combining those two gametes. So uh, now, how many of these individuals are purple? What is the phenotype? of the F1 generation? That's my question to you, given this genotype. <laughs> Guesses? So they all carry the dominant allele, purple, for purple color, so they will all be purple. They will all be purple, 100% in the F1 generation. So all of the individuals in the F1 generation have this genotype. So let's cross them. Let's do a self-fertilization. So now we have one parent that has that genotype, another parent that has that genotype. This is still the F1 generation though, because we're just using individuals from the F1 generation. We'd like to cross them. So what gametes can this individual produce? Well, these alleles will separate with the homologous chromosomes in meiosis. So one gamete could have uh, the dominant one and another one could have the recessive one. The same with the other one. So what possible combinations can we have? That's what the Punnett square is so good for. This is our Punnett square. And we'll show the gametes that came from the dad. And we'll show the gametes that came from the mom. This is an egg. <laughs> and then using the Punnett square, we could look at all the different ways fertilization can occur between all the different gametes that were produced. So these two gametes could have gotten together. This one could have gotten together. Um, this one, we always put the capital letter first and this one. So we have a probability here of, of three different genotypes. And the question you need to ask is, uh, what is the ratio of purple to white 
phenotype. What is the ratio? So, homozygous dominant, both dominant alleles will express purple. Heterozygous individual, just one dominant allele, it's all it needs, will express purple. Purple. Only the two recessive alleles together will express white. So there will be a three to one phenotypic ratio there. So phenotype is the color, in this case, purple, purple, purple to one white. So three to one. What are the genotypes? Homozygous dominant, two heterozygous individuals, and one homozygous recessive. So that ratio is one to two to one. So that has a different ratio, of course. Now, what if we were considering crossing two individuals, but we didn't know the genotype of the one expressing the dominant trait? So this is one genotype. How can we determine with a test cross whether or not this individual is homozygous dominant or heterozygous? Well. It's only by trial and error that we can do that. So if we cross this individual um, with a homozygous recessive individual, there are two possible Punnett squares. Whoops, hang on. We'll always know that only recessive alleles can come from this individual, but this one could be either homozygous dominant or heterozygous. We don't know because we don't know the genotype just based on what the individual looks like. So we have to do a test cross. So in this case, we'll get a capital P, little p, capital P, little p, capital P, little P, capital P, little P, they will all be purple. In this case, we'll get capital P, little P, capital P, little P, little P, little P, and little P, little P. So they'll be half and half, purple and white. And that's called a test cross. So I'd like to stop there and then we'll, we'll get some practice. Thanks for watching.